welcome back to this new creepy news episode. Today I wanted to go over a case that occurred in the early 1900s or perhaps I should say the late 1800s because the span of crimes in question occurred literally between 1899 and 1900 itself and they were committed by a man named Martin Stickles. So today I'm going to be narrating the details they have of this old case. They described the following. He was known as the Kelso Killer, and of course, like most of these cases, he was an American serial killer, and he murdered three people in Cowlitz County, Washington, between 1899 and 1900. Convicted of these murders and sentenced to death, he was executed for the killings a year later, despite concerns over a possible mental illness. That's where it gets kind of twisted, perhaps, if someone is mentally ill, they usually throw them in a psychiatric ward or, or something of that kind so they'd be locked up for life and just be crazy behind bars in a different way but they just executed this guy because it was more common back in the day in general now concerning his early life they wrote the following stickles was born on february 7th 1870 in adams county iowa but was brought to washington when he was 18 months old when his whole family moved to the state According to his mother, Martin was a born a sickly child who would always get mad at everybody without any normal reason and was considered unnatural. Little was known about his life before the murders, but by the time of the killings, Stickless was living as a recluse on a scow, sailing along the Columbia, Colitz and Coamiman rivers, earning a living as a fisherman. Seems fine and I'll be a fisherman that just has a short temper. Nothing wrong with that. Beat up some fish, collect them and sell them on the black market. Not that that's how you do that. At least he would have been uh, having a nice life if we could say that if he stuck to that. But of course, ultimately this guy ended up murdering people because, can you guess the motive? After you kill someone, yep, it was robbery. He was into that sort of stuff. Like the previous video I did where the Dutch guy also had his motive to rob the victims. And this one is no different. So they had the following to say about it. His first victim was named William Shankling. He was a bachelor farmer, a former neighbor of Stickless, whom he had known since an early age. On November 22nd, 1899, while Shankling was eating supper at the dinner table of his cabin in Kelso, Martin shot him with a rifle through the window, killing him on the spot. He then broke into the house and robbed any valuable items he could find setting it ablaze to cover up his tracks. Despite the local sheriff's effort to solve the case and a $300 reward from Governor John Rankin Rogers, nobody was convicted. Another man, a weaver, was initially tried for the murder but later released and it was claimed that Stickless had attended the trial. Of course it didn't stop there because there was this other couple that got murdered by him named the Denap couple. And this happened nearly a year later, on November 28th, 1900. Stickless traveled to Castle Rock, where an aged couple, Cornelius Knapp and his wife, were living. While they were having supper at their table, both were fatally shot with a rifle through the window, killing both. Like the previous case, he burgled into the house and stole all valuables. But this time, he didn't set fire to the place. That's absolutely disturbing and kind of spooky if you think about it. You know, I don't live on the... Uh, you know, ground floor. I live higher up, basically have a balcony and stuff like that. But the idea of you just sitting at your dinner table, enjoying your food, and then somebody standing outside of your house, house with a rifle and then just shoot you through the head is kind of disturbing, man. It just happens out of nowhere. It's like you probably don't even know the perpetrator, and the perpetrator doesn't know you. He just figured, well, I'll kill you and I'll take your stuff. That's fucking scary in a way. Suggest you close your curtains from now on when you're sitting at home eating dinner. That's what I do all the time so nobody can see where I'm actually at inside of my home. Or at least it's a little tricky to figure that out. But of course don't be paranoid now. In the end they did manage to catch the perpetrator Mr. Martin Stickless. And the detectives and trial imprisonment and execution had the following details on the wikis. Stickless was brought for interrogation about the killings protesting his innocence until the investigators revealed that they had identified a watch and some keys as belonging to Shanklin. At that point, Martin confessed to all three murders, but also tried to implicate a neighbor, Edward Pierce, as the shooter and portraying himself as a simple accomplice. 
In his version of the events, Stickless was swayed by the promised loot and did take an active part in the planning of the murders, but didn't take part of the murders themselves. However, this claim was disputed by the sheriffs, who were convinced that there had been a single shooter, since only a single pair of footprints were found in the snow leading to one of the crime scenes, and Pierce was confirmed to have been at his skull at the Columbia River at the time of the murders. While telling of the crimes, it was noted that Stiglitz had described them with childish indifference, only occasionally laughing at some parts and apparently feeling joyful when retelling the stories, unaware that he had contradicted himself in several instances. While awaiting trial for the crimes at the Pierce County Jail in December, the prisoners were visited by the members of the Salvation Army. After one of the sermons, apparently moved by the preacher's words, Stiglitz decided to convert to the Christian faith and admitted before the priests that he alone had committed all the murders. Despite the looming possibility of a death sentence, Stiglitz remained cheerful and claimed that he would be happy with whatever sentence was imposed on him by the court. On the date of his arraignment before the superior court, he pled not guilty. His lawyers and family claimed that Martin should be treated leniently as he was of unsound mind and had always been unnatural. Despite this, after only an hour of deliberation, the jury found him guilty and Justice Miller sentenced the defendant to hang. On January 25, 1901, Martin Stickness was brought to the gallows and after delivering a short speech to the attending parties, he voiced his wish that Jesus would embrace him in heaven. The rope was then put around his neck and the drop sprung, killing him almost instantly. However, the drop was miscalculated, resulting in flesh being torn off from the murderer's neck and blood spurting out from the wounds. <laughs> this, <laughs> this solid turns absolutely gruesome. Okay, here I was trying to narrate this all serious. Uh, there, I messed it up. I'll just keep it in anyway. This is what happened behind the scenes, just so you know. For anybody that's curious about how you narrate cases like this, this is what happens. Now, after that happened, right, they say, after a few minutes, the psychiatrist checked for Pulse, confirming that Stiglitz was dead, and quickly turned over the body towards his family for burial. While the final rites were performed, the attendees took notice of a mysterious veiled woman who left shortly after. It was later learned that she had been promised marriage by Stiglitz via a newspaper ad. The execution later served as a main talking point of an article discussing botched executions in Washington state, along with that of wife murderer Richard Quinn in 1910. And that is the end of the article. Now it's actually pretty bizarre to hear about how that execution went kind of wrong, but it actually happened more than we might realize. Uh, from the top of my head, I don't have any names right now of cases where it occurred, but I do remember vaguely in the past on my old channel when sharing some cases there that we did cover some where the execution went kind of bad. Then at the same time, maybe it's in a twisted way almost comical because the people on death row aren't there uh, without any good reason. They have done gruesome things themselves, so it's kind of like justice anyway. But, you know, it reminds me of stories of people that get the electric chair and then for some reason it doesn't work properly so the person survives and they get like electrocuted but also survive at the same time. It's kind of messed up to go through, I'd imagine. And this one with Mr. Stiglitz also sounds absolutely painful and bizarre to have flesh being ripped off your neck as you're being hung. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds great. I guess it was a fitting end for his life. Because after all, he cold-bloodedly murdered at least three people. People who were enjoying a nice meal. Maybe they had a long day's work behind them. They just wanted to relax, refuel, eat some nice food. And then a bullet entered their brain out of nowhere. Disgusting, despicable crimes. And all just to rob these people of their supposed valuables. Not a one of those weirdos. But then again, maybe he was mentally ill can reason anybody that kills others is mentally ill to a certain extent but perhaps this guy just was mentally had a how to put this nicely had a sort of mental disability I was, he was mentally a little slow who knows anyways with that being said dear viewer have sweet dreams